So my name is Olivia Tinkani. I'm an independent educator and consultant. I teach business skills to farmers and ranchers, and I am also the program coordinator for Meet to Market. Uh, Meet to Market is a fruitful partnership between the IAC, which you all know a little bit about at this point, and SWIGLA, the Southwest Grass-Fed Livestock Alliance. So we are an extensive online business training program for native livestock producers all across Indian country, encouraging you to embrace the possibility of direct marketing your meat and providing skills to do so. How's my sound? Is everybody okay in the back over there? Okay, good. Swigla, for those of you that have not heard of it, is a small nonprofit alliance of ranchers, consumers, chefs, and land managers who work together to support local grass-fed livestock products in the Southwest through producer support and education and consumer and chef outreach. So Meat to Market last, launched last year at the conference here. Um, so we are a year in after two years of development and design. We are a series of almost 30 different courses. We did three last year live at the workshop. We're doing four this year. Um, sorry, live at the conference, for this year, live at the conference, and in between is a bunch of webinars. Um, we run our courses a few times a month, They're taught by a group of almost 150 native and non-native pr thought practitioners and processor and producer guest speakers telling their real life stories about our topics. And our webinars will run through the spring of 2024. Um, all the courses are a la carte. So you can pick and choose what you want to learn from. They, are, they have all been recorded. These are being recorded today too. And they are put online on the IAC Mighty Network's uh, online e-learning platform. You can click through to that through the IAC website. You can also click through to the Meat to Market page. Um, we are under the resources section. And there is a handout here at the front with a handy QR code. I encourage you all to sign up for Meat to Market announcements. We're on a brief hiatus after the conference and our webinars will start again in February. Um, and we'll reference a few of them today as well. Uh, so take a flyer. And we also have an amazing opportunity next year for specifically for Southwestern producers. Any, any producers in the Southwest in this room. Okay, so Swigla is supporting 10 hours of free one-on-one -on -one business consulting with me, business advising about anything that you want to talk about under the sun, as long as you're living in the Southwest, that has to do with your meat operation or your future meat operation. So you can be in an ideation stage also. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a different flyer up front, and I encourage you to take that and... Um, and get in touch to be nominated. We have a couple slots left for next year for that. And lastly, I'll be doing some speed consulting, some, some like quick half hour sessions tomorrow after the official conference ends. If you're interested in hanging out with me for a half hour and talking about your pain points and your joys and your happiness, we can actually get a lot done in a half hour. Um, there's a different sign up. Put your name there, give me your phone number, and I'll text you what time we can, we can text to find out what time we can meet tomorrow afternoon. So that is my little preamble. And with that, I'm going to have us introduce our speakers. They're going to introduce themselves, and then Vanessa and I are going to do a little presentation, and then we're going to have a roundtable discussion and hopefully some engagement with you all as well. So Vanessa, who are you? Um, so, Gully Sogwek, Vanessa Miller, Ni Yoon Gats. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Miller. I am the Food and Ag Area Manager for the United Nation and Oneida Nation Citizen as well. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, we operate on the organizational side, um, two different beef operations around a 6,000 acre Oneida Nation farm enterprise, um, holding approximately 450 um, black Angus beef herd, as well as a 160 around bison herd. Um, we also have a programmatic side, Jinhinkwa, which translates to um, life sustenance, Oneida Nation indigenous farm, around a 75 head um, grass finished shorthorn herd as well. So. Lots of stuff Oneida's doing. All right. Halito Siahoke Pixie. I'm from Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I run a small beef operation in central Oregon. Um, usually I'm running about 60 head, in including yearlings, um, on 43 acres irrigated. And I do a CSA, quarters, halves, and holes, um, providing food for sometimes for typically for BIPOC people and um, tiered pricing and things like that for other other folks who are buying my beef. Thanks for having me. 
Kwai and Louise Amy Rose Fole. I'm Penobscot Alan of Ottawa, and I am operating a um, diversified vegetable orchard, viticulture, and um, poultry, rabbit. We're not doing beef this year. Um, I have about so many goats, way too many goats, and uh, and hogs right now. Um, my farm is a nonprofit. We provide free food, seeds, plants, educational support, technical assistance, volunteer coordination, and education for anyone that wants to grow. Usually, the back, mostly the BIPOC community, and free firewood, as well as workshops on uh, forest farming, agroforestry, woodlot management, and uh, seed saving. What else do you do? Uh, I'm a busy <laughs> um, Kwayana, my name is Spring Alaska. Native name is Upingsrak. I'm a Nupiat, King and Kamu clan from uh, Nome originally, uh, born and raised Valdez, Alaska. I live in Bend, Oregon. I have a small uh, tribal food education, food sovereignty farm. Um, we grow a lot of food. We do not have animals. We did have chickens, but the owls ate them all and the coyotes. Um, I do a lot of education. We have value-added uh, tribal food products. We have about 200 wholesale accounts nationally and internationally. 90% of our sales are to native-owned businesses, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we have a pretty interesting way of distributing our food and profiting where we donate all the food, the tribal food that we grow first, and then we use the remaining to create tribal value-added food products. Um, I do a lot of the same things that Amy does Seed Keeper, Indigenous Education, TEK, a lot of technical assistance and state and national policy work. I sleep a lot <laughs> when I have a chance, but yeah, I'm really thankful to be here today and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Her stuff is great. Check it out. Super great. Check it out. <laughs> Sakari Farms, check it out. Um, and for those of you who are interested in having the presentation, <clears throat> there's some live links in it to um, just sign up on the Meat to Market sign-up page, and I'll send you all the presentation as well. But we'll get to everybody's contact info too. So sales, strategy, and food sovereignty, feeding your community while feeding your business. That is what we're here to talk about today. Um, so we already told you who we were. So essentially, I think we're all really used to thinking about what the hustle is, right? The financial sales transaction. But the big question that we're here to talk about today, probably not answer, but talk about, is can you integrate your desire to support and educate and enrich your community and attend to and even integrate your family, directly address food security, sovereignty, and self-governance while still creating a revenue positive business? That's the goal, right? Essentially, this workshop is to help green light those things cohabitating together. And the desired result is a business that makes money through diverse sales channels, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit, wholesale and direct to consumer, advocating for experimenting in both of those, that can also cover its costs and address community food sovereignty and security inside of its business model rather than tangential to it. So really kind of honing in on what Olivia said here about the hustle, right? So the big question, it seems, for ag operations to be quote unquote successful. It seems like there's a constant pull of four competing strategies, um, feeding the community and pricing and profitability. Um, of course, food sovereignty, maximizing food production to feed and meet your community needs. Um, rights of nature, your commitment to our natural environment and being responsible to those um, up responsibilities. Um, affordability, making sure that you have products that your community can access and purchase. Um, and then profit motive, of course, being financially self-sustainable. So we're here to kind of explain that maybe this matrix is not, that there's overlaps here, right? We're looking for the Venn diagram between all these things. Um, so we wanna normalize what might be considered tangential activities by talking about some nuts and bolts way to actually do that and codifying them into our, our values-driven business models. Um, one thing that we have talked about in our group and that I think about a lot is, is how to assess your business on a scale of community wealth rather than just financial wealth, right? What's the model for that? And have that be part of your decision making. What are the alternative currencies we can gauge our business in, our businesses' successes in? Is there spiritual, cultural, natural capital um, currencies that, that are different but alongside of financial 
capital that we gauge our success by and show some examples and some tools for good sales strategy creation and most importantly tracking, um, which is just a sort of the key to all of it, that will also allow you to then weave education, mutual aid, barter, culturally relevant product offerings, all these things that these ladies up here do into your operations channels and activities, again, rather than like alongside of it. Um, so what we like to think of as sovereignty as local economy, right? That's Vanessa, that's your phrase. And, and rather than just sidelining it and having it be over here. And we're going to talk a little bit about how tribal government and structure can support you all in doing that in, in creating economic resiliency. So I'm going to talk about a little bit sales strategy basics and propose this kind of hybrid model to y'all. Then we're going to talk about pricing and then we're going to get to the interesting conversation over here. So we're going to go a little fast again put your name up there if you want this presentation so you can really marinate on it later. Um, how do I choose a sales channel? Where am I selling, right? Channel is where do my products go to? Number one, core values. So we advocate for having and understanding the core values of your business so they're intimately connected to who you are as a human. If you want to learn more about that, come see me and Chance Weston at 430 in this room, and we have a little core values exercise for you. Market context. What does market research tell you that the, ge that the general environment for your work is? What, is? what does the market need? What does it lack in terms of products and services? And the connectivity between the two of them, between supply and demand, that's your actual sales channel. Again, these are all important elements, not just, uh, they're not in an order of priorities. Your target audience, who are you selling to? Understand their buying patterns, understand their choices and what they purchase, but also how and where. Um, what are your colleague or compet colleague competitors, as we like to call them? What are they doing? What are they selling and at what price? We really don't want you to base your decisions on sales channel choice or pricing on like the horror stories that you hear at the proverbial water cooler, um, which is also otherwise known as the dive bar, um, about what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing with your product, right? So we're conducting proactive investigation rather than like complacent sort of accepting whatever your neighbor tells you you should do and where you should sell. You need to evaluate your operations. Um, you can't decide on a sales channel without understanding what it takes to actually sell through that channel. The logistics, the transport, administration, communication, all of the systems organizing stuff. The volume, does where you want to sell actually accept the volume you can produce at, whether it's low or high? How much time does it take to actually sell through that sales channel? Not just to operate it on a daily or weekly basis, but to make the connections to make it thrive, to make it, to launch it or to maintain it. Uh, the team, you can't do everything by yourself, although I know we often operate in that paradigm. Uh, so what sort of team do you need? And what is your capacity to manage those people? Very often underlooked until you get into a kerfuffle, but let's start thinking about it ahead of time. Uh, exposure, right? Brand awareness that you can gain by a sales channel that maybe not be so obvious um, in terms of your understanding of it and might not be quantifiable in dollars right away, right? Doesn't actually turn into a sale right away, but give you access to a new set of audiences, constituencies, communities that wouldn't otherwise be accessible through a different sales channel. And then risk mitigation. What happens when one um, doesn't perform and you have an opportunity to still sell through a second or third sales channel, something that we experienced in COVID that has become a valuable lesson. So I advocate for a mixed revenue channel approach. What does that mean? Wholesale, restaurants, chefs, caterers, butcher shops, distributors, aggregators, resellers, food hubs, and direct to consumer. The thing maybe we think about the most when you hear direct meat sales, right? CSA, farmer's market, farm stand, online outlets. So like I said, think about it in terms of what happened in COVID. It's insurance. People that had two or more sales channels set up were very easy, easily able to pivot because they didn't have to reinvent themselves from nothing. This is should be a strategy to use all the time, not just in the face of a global emergency. Um, we're looking to build different market channels also to have a avenues for a diverse set of products, right? Some channels want some products and some channels want other products. Um, I can't stress that enough in terms of beef production. You're going to end up with 
200 pounds of ground beef on every animal. Where is it going? You need to create a ground beef channel. Done. Like, I'm just going to throw it out there as what you need to do. <laughs> so in DTC or direct-to-consumer markets, we talk about this a lot because there's usually a higher margin, right? It's a high-touch channel. It's intimate exchanges. But cash is not always king. Um, those channels can also be low volume and they can also be a little bit less stable and more infrequent. Whereas wholesale, which we usually think of as the devil, can offer you dependability in terms of a stability of price, uh, frequency of sale, knowledge ahead of time, and regular intervals that can help control your cash flow. Um, lower margin channels can also give you some different brand exposure, right? They're different audiences. We said that already. And you need to consider that marketing value and considering the opportunity cost, right? Those marketing channels also will spend money to put your name and your brand out there. That's their money, not your money. And you're touching different consumers than you do through your DTC. So you don't have to be huge to, to, to Think about this mentality of a mixed approach um, and looking for balance. And it's really just about debunking the fear of wholesale. And I, and I sing that party line a lot. Um, we're just here to encourage you to try and to understand the benefits of the both and not to make choices based on, on rumors. And we will be diving deep into wholesale strategy in the spring uh, with two different wholesale courses um, online. So here's a little matrix. High volume at the top, low volume at the bottom low margin on the left and high margin on the right. So high volume, high margin channels are no brainers, right? That's, we know those are the winners. Low margin, low volume may be no brainers, but they might serve another purpose, right? They really might be focused on brand positioning. They might be worth it. You still need to make sure that it's not, you're not losing money. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then the ones in the, the, the other two quadrants is a little bit, they take a little bit more, um, Acute thinking and analysis. So high volume, low margin, those are the keepers if you are really securing real margins and they contribute shirts covering your overhead costs. And we're going to talk about that. <coughs> and then the high margin, low volume might seem like keepers because of high margin. But again, low volume doesn't get you that far. you got high margin and you're not selling that much product. So you're not really making that much money to put back into the business. So how do I track? Um, we're going to use an accounting system and that can be paper. It's okay. Uh, it can also be Excel. It can also be accounting software. And we want those to be tracked as separate income categories. So you set up where you're selling as different income categories. You're not selling up seeds and chicken. You're selling up wholesale, setting up wholesale and DTC. So you're tracking income in your sales channel. And then you're tracking your costs in a similar way. Your labor, your cost of production, your cost of processing, and specific marketing costs for each channel separately to calculate the total cost for each channel. This, if you're using accounting software already, this is about setting up your chart of accounts. Um, you can refer back to our financial basics course if that is a foreign language to you, and we will help you figure that out. And then our next step is analyzing the difference between revenue and cost in each channel to gauge what it's really giving back to us, right? So we've looked at a singular channel, but we also want to be looking across all the channels together. You need to know an individual channel's performance, but the collective of all the channels is actually more important. The goal is not to keep the same margin across all the channels. The goal is to have some margin to go back to cover operating costs for your business and ideally a little bit of profit to go back into your pockets, right? So the fixed, the overhead that I'm talking about is the fixed costs that are not counted within the cost of production or post-production, aka processing in the meat world, or any other channel-specific marketing efforts, right? The fixed costs are more stagnant. They don't change despite where you sell. Where you sell. We're talking about rent, overhead, some of your labor that's not production-focused, um, utilities, leases, taxes, that sort of thing. So can the combined result of all your channel's revenue less their costs, support your overhead. This is the analysis you have to do before you gauge where you should be selling. Just trust me on that. And then don't forget to look forward, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to create a budget that will estimate what's going to happen in these channels before you dive into them. And that will set you up to understand how much you can afford to give away or set at a lower price point. 
I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> I know I'm going pretty fast here, but I really want to get to these folks. Um, so pricing strategy, how do I set pricing? This is a really common question we get all the time. There's two ways we go about it together in tandem, um, cost-based and market value-based. They're both right in, in concert with each other. So you begin by calculating those costs directly associated with your sales. That's what I just talked about, right? Production and post-production and any direct labor that goes into it. And then we look at our gross profit, which is our revenue, less that cost of production and post-production. It's got to be per unit positive. You can't be losing a bunch of money on, on every product and expect it just to work out in your checking account at the end of the day, right? And it's got to be positive all across all the sales channels put together. Not every sales channel has to have that same margin, though. Um, from that, you're building in a margin on top of that, right? So you've got your gross profit, which is a number per unit, and you're building in a margin that's gonna cover your farm overhead. How do I know that? Because ideally you're looking at the cost of your business over large periods of time. Again, I encourage you to go back to some of our financial courses to get up to speed with what does that really look like inside the operations of, of your business and why are you doing it? So then we combine that knowledge with market-based pricing. What are people around me doing? Most people just set their pricing based on what the market has doing? What's my neighbor doing? What is this? What is the farmer's market price? And I'm encouraging you to do both of these together. Yes, we care what your neighbor is selling eggs at at the market because sure, you're not going to double that and expect to get a bunch of customers, but it can't be without that cost-based look, right? Okay, so a short example here would be um, outlining your goals of your pricing mix strategy. Um, benchmark your product pricing weekly for all products and then adjust accordingly and being flexible. Um, again, as Olivia said, you know, responding accordingly to the market and your neighbor's prices. Um, Non-tribal retail customers, um, for example, will pay full market um, rate retail pricing as a potential part of your strategy. Um, tribal retail customers then will perceive a certain percentage off based on your policy policy as a discount rate. Um, wholesale sales to intertribal programs will again pay a certain percentage off that you decide of that retail market value. Um, having a competitive advantage, um, having a difference in relative price or relative cost that comes about because you have a difference in your activities being formed. Um, so if you have a real competitive advantage, you have one of two things or both. You operate at a lower cost or you are able to have that higher market premium cost um, due to increased brand identi identity, um, things like that. Um, and then of course, operating effectiveness is the um, ability to perform similar activities better than your competitors. So <clears throat> some tools to do this. Um, we have a yield and margin calculator and an hour webinar explaining yield off of carcass, margin, building margin um, into actually every cut that is up online on the Mighty Networks platform. Um, we encourage you to formulate a strategy, not just for pricing, but this mixed revenue approach by doing these numbers on paper. It's like back of napkin enterprise budgeting before you go into it, right? And then you can introduce potentially like a sliding scale or alternative pricing structure once you've built the pieces together of where else you are selling. Using one sales channel to support potentially lower or no margin channels. You can't do that unless you know what the channel is performing, what it, all of them are performing at. Um, and so business models that include food security efforts like sliding scale pricing or mutual aid or just straight up donation, educational programming that is free, they only work if you dedicate yourself to good planning, good record keeping in the moment, and frequent analysis to understand the overall financial picture of the business. So to sum it up before we go over there, um, Adaption and diversity equals resiliency. We learn this from nature, right? Multiple channels allows you to flex, to adapt, to respond to the environment. Um, take that cue from nature, evolve, right? Don't expect your strategy when you start to be your strategy in year seven. It's not going to be, you're going to learn. Talk, gather, convene, come to conferences, hang out with each other, embrace your competitors, unsilo yourself. You're already out there in a rural environment. 
And maybe you're in a rural reservation environment. So how are you going to fix that sense of loneliness is by talking to people about what you do. So if we sort of take that sense of neighborliness into our business operations, then we see this negative issue of competition as potentially an asset in how we can grow our business acumen, right? And again, we're dealing in social capital, not just financial capital. We need like collective recognition of the impact that you all have. And that also comes from hanging out and talking about it. And, and just have faith that there's room for everybody in the market to undo that sort of competition thinking. So sovereignty in real time, right? Um, how do you kind of balance this self-governance policy advocacy for food sovereignty to expand into true um, self-governance and sovereignty? Um, does your tribe have a tribal food policy? Does your nation have policies in place to support and prioritize you as an indigenous producer? Um, do you have tribal legislation, food codes, agricultural laws that are more flexible, again, to be able to meet your needs and your community needs? Um, um, do you have your food programs that are having set at, in place as priority to support you as an indigenous producer and give you not this competitive, I guess, price that responds to the capitalistic market, but your true value and worth? Um, does your tribe have um, resources to invest in infrastructure to support small businesses and you as an entrepreneur? And then staying informed, of course, of current political climate and any policy change. Um, FDIPR is a big one right now with the farm bill coming up, um, legislation that will fund potential production, um, and then meat processing legislation to extend inspection authorities potentially to tribes. Um, expansion of regulation into self-governance of food programs allows tribes to have that flexibility to design those programs and administer those programs to not only meet the needs of your community, but also um, meet your needs as, and support you as an individual producer, which of course is the same as meeting the needs of the community, right? Um, is your tribal leadership at the table to advocate that? If they're not, why not? Ask them, advocate for that. Um, how can we work together as an organization and your tribal nation, as well as you as an individual and a critical part of that um, tribe and nation to support our food and indigenous producers as a whole? So here are uh, the fundamental elements of everything that we've said, right? Stay committed to your values, trust your knowledge of food source and meaning as an indigenous producer. It starts here. Sell through multiple sales channels with varied pricing models for internal and external communities, which relies on good analysis. Do good budgeting and planning accompanied by good record keeping and accounting. Peer learning, gathering, discussion, sharing, openness, and rejecting fear of competition. Um, explore different business models. These We're going to talk about that with these ladies up here in a minute. doesn't all have to be LLCs. Um, having tribal government programs that support entrepreneurship. Um, wholesale does not have to be the devil if your nation's stance is to invest in preventative health care and your community well-being. Um, staying active in policy development and legislation that affects production and producers, and then continuing to evaluate and monitor your prioritized target outcomes um, with your own customized index, so to speak, of your desired outcomes. This may include a combination of both subjective and objective matter measures, which is by and large the basis of community wealth evaluation. All right, so that was the speed round of sales strategy. Now we're going to come over here and talk to these ladies. Hey. <laughs> What's up, y'all? I know, I can tell y'all are whispering over here. Um, okay, first question. What's your business model? Who do you sell to and how do you create harmony between your community food support and education and your other more traditional market or sales efforts? So we're talking about how food security is braided into your model. It, explain to us a little bit how it works for each of you. We'll just go down the line to start out with. How food security is braided into my model is that I serve a lot of um, BIPOC families, single mothers, New, um, I make first foods for new babies, things like that. Um, and I also, so I sell quarters, halves, and holes, and that's sort of, I use a CSA business model. 
And I'm an LLC. Yep. And, um, and I also have a wicked good side hustle. I'm an author. So if any of you have a book in you and you're trying to create additional funds or looking for grants for being writers and all of that, please talk to me. Um, but food sovereignty and food security is super important to me. And I, um, so I sell, when I sell to a regular customer, let's say in my region, um, sometimes they have the opportunity to donate certain types of meats or organs back to back into my organization, which then I would then turn around and either cook for my community or, um, or, you know, pass those cuts along. So I just, it's, it's a super, um, it's a very like informal approach to, providing my community, but I, I always have beef. It's like my freezer always is full of beef, no matter how many I'm harvesting. Um, so it's just, I feel like that level of, um, like abundance is available to me because of the way that I go about my harvest and go about my, um, customer interactions and things like that. I have a relationship with my customers that makes it possible for me to stay in beef, to just like keep it moving to the people who need it. So and I trade. Oh, sorry. I was about <laughs> to, that was really awkward. It's so hot in here. I don't know if y'all are uncomfortable, but I don't know whether it's a hot flash or what's happening over here. It's a mess, like a sausage on a 7-Eleven roller. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. This is a little over the top in here. So, I'm actually a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, I was a for-profit LLC. I've uh, been farming since 2023 exponentially grown in the last five years um, and evolved a lot. We transitioned to nonprofit and stopped selling any food at all whatsoever about five years ago. Um, what we do to make sure all of our food and firewood is given away free of charge to anyone in need and we also provide um, plants, seeds, all that sort of stuff and livestock uh, to BIPOC communities or individual growers that want to grow for themselves. We do that through selling seeds. And then we also have um, gardens for culturally significant seeds that are not sold to the general public. But we do speaking engagements, uh, small workshops for the general public as well um, that are revenue. yeah that create revenue. Yes, we charge a premium for the general public. Um, generally 45 minutes for $3,000. And then that allows me to be able to donate all of our food and firewood back. We also started, the first year was a mess because I'm hard headed. I know that's a uh, negative for me, but with, I like to say co-conspirators and not competition because I've gotten some of the best opportunities and referrals for speaking engagements from other native farmers or black farmers in my area. And, um, we allow for the workshops, the general public that pays for all the tickets. Then we also invite native or um, tribal members in the area to come for free. And they can take home whatever they want as well. Um, we work with other groups like the Rotary and just small nonprofits in the area to distribute that, that food. I had uh, made the really bad mistake of trying to do everything myself the first year that we were donating everything. No one works harder than a woman who does not want to ask for help. It's the worst. But now, um, and I know that laws are different in every state. Like I think I've heard that Nevada is not very friendly to smallholder farmers. I could be wrong. Very restrictive. I can butcher a hog on farm and give it away, whether it's quartered, it's processed out into packages, doesn't matter. I can give that food away. Can't sell it. I can sell the rabbits and the chickens, but um, we don't sell them. Um, yeah, we also, uh, oh gosh, I don't even want to say this. We have a photographer that uh, comes and donates um, time every year. And, oh, I'm so embarrassed. So we had to get really creative and start thinking out of the box. One thing that we make a lot of revenue on every year, we get donations from Altria, which is uh, Philip Morris Reynolds. Um, I don't know, they do cigarettes, cigarette money. So I'll take their money, take all those dollars and redistribute into something better. I don't care. Um, so we get donations from them for printing costs, and we have a photographer that comes and donates a day. Um, and we put out a uh, sexy farmer calendar of all of my, none of them are real model material, <laughs> but we get more men than we can, ha oh shoot, you brought it with you. Um, yeah, we, revenue. 
sell them online. Creative some people do come. Yeah, some people do come up to the farm and pick them up. Um, I try to limit how many people I have coming and going, especially if other farmers in the area have the same kind of livestock for just biosecurity. We try to keep them or make them change their boots. Um, but yeah, we sell about a thousand of those at twenty five dollars a pop every single year. And uh, we have tons of volunteers, so I don't have any uh, overhead. It's really great. I have sometimes more volunteers than I can manage. They come from far, as far away as like Tennessee and North Carolina, and it's really great. Once I started asking for help and I got smart, we have days that I'll have a mob of other female farmers in my area that will help me break down hogs or break down goats and um, makes, you know, the work really light. And all that food gets uh, donated into the community, usually the same day. It's all gone. And it's really great. They're not my competition. They're my biggest strength. That's what my cash is. My cash is not what's in my pantry, what's in my bank. It's the people around me. And they're always there for me. I've never had them say no. It's pretty great. I need to get a calendar going. <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. Um, so I, <laughs> there's so many ideas going on here. So embarrassed. Um, I'll try and remember part of the question. How I loop my business into food sovereignty is that um, I had a hard time finding my traditional foods. I'm from Alaska, so everything's subsistence-based. Um, I'm from a poor family, and but we're rich, we're good people, and we'll do anything for anyone. And it's a bad habit that I still have where I just want to help everyone and make sure they have free food and opportunities. So all the classes that I teach, um, I make sure that they're free for natives. I pivot a lot of white money because um, I think that they owe us some money. And I just turn it around and give it all back to my native people. It's very intertribal where I live. Um, it's intertribal where I'm from in Alaska, in the Chugach region. You're up from Copper River, right? So we work with the Athabascan people. We work with the Chugach people in the Supiak, and I'm a Nupiak up from the north, but I'm not getting a big intertribal feel down here in Oregon. Um, I'm sure I'll get in trouble for that, but I'm used to just helping. <laughs> we all help each other. And so I started the business because I couldn't access my own tribal foods. So I pivot a lot of money. I write a lot of grants. I do a lot of speaking. Um, I think we're all doing too much just to feed our people. I'll just say it. If it doesn't get said today, it's affecting my mental health and my gray hairs and everything else. I think I'm shrinking too. <laughs> it could be because I'm a Nupiak. But, um, so I, I pivot a lot of money and get them to pay me to pay my people or, you know, feed our people. So we donate all the food that we grow first, all the good stuff, all the traditional foods. We have ancestral seed from all over Indian country. We work with other tribes as a seed keeper, grow it out. And then whatever's left, we make these serious, high quality, value-added food products. And so a lot of natives, as you know, we, uh, we store things through the winter. We're hunter-gatherer. A lot of us eat fish, berries, and meat. So what we have a year-round farm. So it, it ends in like November, but we have all the food stored for the rest of the year to pull from and make value-added food products. We have a new tribal commercial kitchen building that is loaded with freezers that we pull all the peppers from and all the food that we grow and make value-added food products. So it sustains us through the winter or year-round months uh, with that profit. I feel like there's a lot more that I could get on, but that's pretty like quick and, and sassy. Yeah, yeah. Gets it is that spring makes those super badass high quality products and sell them sells them at a badass price, and that's the pivoting of the money, right? All right, Vanessa, you're gonna ask this. Yeah. So, sort of a multifaceted question here with several parts. Um, how do you interact with your tribe as an entrepreneur or small business if you could tell your tribal leadership one thing to support your work in getting your food into your community while still <laughs> running a net positive business that supports you and your community, what would it be? How does this change if you're living and working far away from your community? Uh, I think it changes a lot because I'm very far from my nation, which is located in southeastern Oklahoma, and I'm in, like, diasporic all the way in central Oregon is where I found myself. Um, so that makes it really difficult because I'm, my people are not wholly there. Um, but what I would want my nation to know is that food should be free, and I like producing and growing um, food for our people. And so how can that be subsidized or... You know, what are the ways in which I can be paid to be a grower, um, even if I'm outside of my 
tribal lands? Oh, I guess we're all pretty far away. So, um, yeah, my family's from Udenak, Quebec, and Indian Island, Maine. And But I, I, must, I hate snow. I'm a southerner at heart. I got there as soon as I could. Now they're stuck with me. Um, but, yeah, food is a human right. And I guess I'm turning into my grandmother in a way, but there's worse things that I could become in life. So seed hoarding and feeding people, that's my, uh, that's my bad habit. Um, oh, I don't even really know how to answer that question, honestly. I do a lot of uh, mailing things back home to band members. Um, what would you want your tribe to do to support you? Mm. Your tribe is anybody. <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that question, honestly. I don't want to make something up or lie to y'all, but I honestly don't even know what I would say. I don't like asking for help. It's really hard, and it's not a good thing. It's not good for my mental health, just like you were saying. Um, it's really hard for me, and I don't know why that is. But, yeah, I don't know what I would say. Um, it, it does break my heart. I miss that. But I've been able to turn it around, create my own family, um, working with the tribes in my area. And I don't know. It's so life-giving. I love it. I'm really far. Um, I know that my my dad uh, was the president of our tribe, and he's not with us. But I know that my native corporation and tribe is not happy that I'm not home because I went to college and was supposed to come back and work in the village, and I didn't. Um, I think I want them to to know that I'm doing amazing work down here in the lower 48. And I think if you're not on your reservation or not at your tribe, you shouldn't be penalized for that because I'm doing, I can't go home. I'm trying to break generational trauma and heal my people and heal my daughter and make sure that we're in a healthy space um, to do this good work. I can go home, you know, at some point, but um, just to communicate and, and allow us to do the work wherever we're at, wherever we're at, we can't penalize our children or offspring or relatives because they choose to move off the reservation or native region and do that good work. So I want them to know that I'm killing it down here. I just can't get oh, home and that I shouldn't be penalized. Like I know that I get a lot of grief in Oregon because I'm not from an Oregon tribe. I don't look native enough. It's gross. So if like, what are those people doing? Are they in the food sovereignty world? Are they on the ground working every day? Usually not. They just have an opinion about that you need to look different and you can't uh, have a part of our food sovereignty in our region because you don't understand our foods. Well, the Oregon tribes have salmon, berries, and roots, just like we do in Alaska. A lot of them are the same. So then the conversation ends at that point. Well, it's like, well, okay. we're doing the same work with the same relative plant relatives and, and food relatives. So cheers to that, you know? So I would just say, let us do our work. Um, it's a different generation. We're not all stuck in our reservation. It's not the old ways. There's money now. There's competition and capitalism and oppression. So we have to work. We're doing our best to work within those realms of things that aren't going to change quickly. So we, sh we need to be supported, not penalized. All right. This question might be mostly for you, Spring, but uh, Pixie, feel free to, to pipe up also because I think it's meaningful in terms of the cycles that you go through in running your business. And I think it's a little bit less relevant for Amy Rose as a 501c3, but I want to talk, I talked about pricing a lot and you, we were talked about it a little bit with you, but give us an example of how you set that pricing <clears throat> inside of the markets who can be perceived as not being able to afford your food, right? Like how do you actually do that? And are you tracking costs and, um, against that revenue to know whether it can work for you to be able to sell at that price. And I want y'all to be super honest because I think that the important thing is to understand in this group what, what everybody's trying, right? What have they, what have, what have y'all attempted? What works and what doesn't work? And that pricing to, to cost relationship. I'm going to pass. That's huge. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble again, but I, I pivot a lot of money and, you know, through grants and donations um, to make sure that there's always money for blankets and food and whatever they need. Um, so it's basically if somebody really needs something in their native and they ask for it, or I'll just, I know they need it and I'll give it to them because we all have a hard time asking for things. Um, they just, so that's the price point is um, if you're native, it's, you know, wholesale, basically. Mm -hmm. If you're not native, 
it's super full price, um, extra. If you <laughs> ask me too many questions about sweetgrass or how things are used or certain medicines, I won't sell it to you if it's a non-native. I just won't let you have it because if you don't know what our medicine's for, you don't need it. And I don't have the capacity to do education for everybody that's not native. Um, I'll drop everything I'm doing to tell a native person how to prepare something. I teach tribal cooking classes and do medicine work. Um, but then we have um, a lot of wholesale, which it is kind of the devil because you're giving it away at half price, but then you're getting rid of it in mass quantity so that you're not handholding that retail, the shipping and, and you know, so um, selling two to five units at a time is great, but then if you can sell a thousand units, yeehaw. So I don't have a good answer to that, except I'm just always pressuring to get assistance from non-natives to help us feed our people. So that's how I do it is just whoever need you can see the need in people when they approach you or from far away. Um, I think native women and mothers are empaths, empath empaths, and we can just tell. Um, if you've been through any trauma, you're just oversensitized and you know who needs help and kind of what. So that's how we distribute our food is by the, the need basis. That's not a direct answer. But. I don't have a spreadsheet. <clears throat> yeah, it would, I think that like the diagram for my business is that I've got so many costs, right? I have all my upfront costs of paying for water, paying for irrigation, paying for mineral, salt, um, I cut my own hay, so there's cutting and baling hay and all of that. And then there's whatever comes up that's surprise, which is always there's like emergency money, pipes breaking and irrigators going down and and uh, electrical stuff happening and yeah, all kinds of stuff. So there, it feels like for me, like there's all these different, you know, the diagram when I start mapping it out is not just a like, here's my expense sheet, here's my profit sheet. It's like there's, there's it's anybody's guess based on the weather and how the grass grows and all these different things. So I don't always track and know. What I know is that I need to bring in extra, extra more to make sure that I'm paying, you know, paying myself, paying my own bills, making sure I can and like get vet assistance for my bovine if I need them, et cetera. Um, so, so it's, you know, gosh, I wish I had a better way of explaining it, but there's so many moving parts. As long as I'm coming out on top, I'm generally not complaining. And when I have extra, I give it away or share it. So. And, um, that's awesome. Thanks. Y'all you know, for being super upfront with how you think through things and what you do. And I think, you know, what part of what we're advocating for is that extra step in thinking forward about it so that there's less guessing, right? So there's less guesswork so that you have ideally more to give away, right? At the end of the day by doing that forward thinking. Um, I'm going to throw something out at y'all that <clears throat> was lingering in our notes, but that we didn't talk about ahead of time because I think it's a pertinent way to sort of close out this, this session is um, we talked about it in one of our conversations preparing for this, but the question came up of how do we stay? Um, how do you stay right? When the, the world is sort of leaning towards extermination, where do you find balance? And as three women who work extremely hard and have already admitted that you work too hard and the front hustle and the back hustle. I want you to just think for a minute of some words of advice for finding balance and balance towards resilience. Wow. Um, how much time do we have on this? The secret is there's a break. Okay. Okay. Um, so we stay connected, right? We, we find all the reasons to laugh and commiserate and um, some of us bead together or, you know, do different things together that, that generate energy to keep on going. I'm in the middle of a giant restructure. Um, I started my operation 10 years ago with 20 cows and two bulls. And it's been a cow-calf operation moving through all the seasons, you know, in a really, I think, in a really good way. Everything's born there. Everything's harvested there. Nothing gets on a truck. Um, and then I had a divorce a couple of years ago. My dad died four weeks ago. So I've had like these different, um, like I've been resourced in different ways to run my business in certain ways. So the restructuring originally when some of these things started busting and my, the way I'd been running things in a pretty tight ship blew up or, you know, evaporated, I, I started to really stress out. And it took a lot of energy away from me and away from what I wanted to be creating and doing with my business. And um, 
And then I was like, well, I'll always be in food. I'll always be in communion with my native people. And I'll, I may not be doing it this way. Maybe I'll bring in feeders. Maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll do it a different, maybe I'll keep my cows on somebody else's land and not be a landowner. Or there's so many different ways to go about being, um, I don't know if it's, if it's being like a life giver and a, and a, you know, walking womb, but like, I'll never not be providing food, cooking for people, raising animals. Um, you know, maybe I'll be doing it at at my nation's, um, region. I I have no idea where the wind's going to blow me, but I know that there's, that I'll always be doing this because this is our, these are birthrights and our life ways. And, um, big changes coming through COVID and different things like that aren't really a threat. And I think that, you know, our history's people of removal and being asked to farm certain things and having commodities dropped and stuff like that. Like we know in our bones that we can be adaptable and change and grow and, um, and wipe away like an entire model and then like scrap it and start new dreams, you know, like, we can change our whole entire lives just from a dream we had. <laughs> so <laughs> lucky us, right? Yeah. Um, ironic thing about that. I almost wore a shirt today that said, the hell I won't. <laughs> if anyone really knows me, that's me to a T. And it's not, for me, it's not career work. It's heart work. <laughs> I have become, I feel like I'm the luckiest human being on this earth because I feel like I have become that old man saying, oh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And I know that's not the reality for a lot of people. I am so grateful that I've been able to create this life for myself. Um, But just like you said, there's so many more moving parts. I'm a busybody. That's how I stay. And I always, it's like keeping plates spinning. And also, you know, there's, um, I'm going to start talking in cliches. I always have like backup plans for everything. I'm a very circular thinker and not necessarily linear. It's 26 letters in the alphabet. If plan A don't work, I'm going to keep going. It's just how I am. I'm relentless and it probably drives people insane. Um, But I'm always thinking, I'm like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? We have hip campers there almost every single day and we charge $100 a night for tent camping. I don't have to do anything. And they buy eggs on top of that for probably double what you would pay at the farmer's market because they don't want to go anywhere. And they buy hot sauce and honey out of our beehives. And um, they can pay to come get the eggs out of the coop, which is even better because I don't have to do the work. Uh, I'm a lazy farmer. If I don't got to do it myself, I will have somebody else do it and pay me to do it. You always got to find another way. And so that's how we stay, I guess. Um, yeah, I think I'll be doing this work for a long time. It'll just lead more into policy. I do a lot of policy work. Um, if it's, I see, um, the need in looking for things that don't work and it shouldn't be negative because the things that are working is obvious. The things that aren't working, um, need to be fixed. So that's some of the work that I do. I think that I'll continue to stay at this, um, as long as people can communicate, which seems to be difficult for humans and remain honest because you can get a lot more food in our community when there's open, healthy, honest communication. A little eye contact is helpful. Um, just working with people who are honest and that if you're communicating well, if you're showing up and being present and on time and respecting people's time, um, you can get a lot of work done within our our tribal nations here in, in Indian country and get that food distributed. And that's my short answer on that. You all performed exceptionally well with the curveball. I deeply appreciate it. And we're actually perfectly on time. So I would just like to thank all three of you for your wonderful responses and reflections. And um, just open it up for any questions for anybody before you all dash out the door. Anybody want to ask anything? All right.